Welcome to uh, this how to refactor, how to reactive, how to build reactive server engine. And first of all, I would like to define for whom this talk. First of all, this talk is for whom who would like to learn a little bit more about Neo. Also, this talk is for those who would like to see Project Reactor in action. And this talk is for whom would like to to understand how reactive approach fits uh, the server, the server area. If you uh, think you fit this um, this criteria, I would like to welcome you. If you, in case if you don't think you uh, you like to learn exactly this, I will recommend you to to go to another uh, to another session. There is a lot of interesting and amazing speaker. In case if you still with me, welcome again. My name is Oleg. My name is Oleg Dukuka. I'm from Ukraine, from Kyiv. In Kyiv, it's a little bit colder than, than here. It's like minus eight, I guess. But, but nevertheless, it's an amazing city. And I'm, welcome, I'm welcoming you to visit Ukraine and Kyiv if you have never been there. So I work for Netify, and I am mostly a reactive software engineer. I do a lot of reactive stuff. I'm contributing project reactor. I'm contributing our socket, which is uh, new reactive server cross-server network protocol, which we are building at Netify, and also I'm contributing a lot to our to, to in order to build my local community by organizing big conferences and local meetups. Also, I am an author of uh, this book, so if you would like to learn something uh, a little bit more in, about reactive approach in Spring Five, I'm welcoming you to just come to me after. Uh, after this talk, and I'm share with you all possible discounts. So today, I'm going to contribute to your understanding about uh, reactive engine approach and how to build that. So first of all, we will start with understanding what would we like to see uh, as reactive server engine from the user perspective. Then we try to understand why do we need that? Why do we exactly need reactive server approach? What's wrong with any other approach. And finally, we will understand how to build this. All right, so far so good? Okay, so start with understanding what you would like to see under the reactive server engine. First of all, we would like to see a server which are capable to be into some port which is visible to some um, external world and which is capable to handle connections. So as a user, we would like to build some logic on top of that. So we would like to, to have a connections handling under the primitive server engine. And we would like to build uh, some pipeline or some flow of transformation efforts or processing data that is coming from connect that connection. And we would like to build some pipeline of processing and writing this data to, 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 to this connection. So this is the essential part that we would like to see. Also, we would like to build an efficient reactive server engine. So we would like to, to, uh, to, to have some worker pool which, which is capable to, to handle all the connections and efficiently utilize our engine. So we would like to, uh, to, 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 to have a connection attached to some worker or pool of workers. And we would like to see something called bug pressure. So what bug pressure is? Uh, but pressure is a basically uh, we don't like to 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 to, to have more data in, on our server than it's uh, our, our connection is ready to handle. So we would like to see a writing driven reading from from this connection. So it sounds a little bit wired, but you would don't like to overwhelm our server, but by incoming data. So we would like to to keep our server resilient and our server engine resilient. And finally, we would like to, if, if we can, some request for, for data. For example, if we're ready to write some data, we would like to process it through our, uh, from, through our uh, processing pipeline. So this is the essential part that we would like to see in our reactive server engine. From the code perspective, our reactive server engine could look like this. So we, the, the, the first two lines is just create server engine. It doesn't mean that it beans our server. So we just create because everything is reactive, it's lazy, it's synchronous, so we just need to, to define that here should be a cost and port for our server. Also, we would like 
to define in this way a handling of our server. So we would like to define some function that would handle connection. And connection, in, our, in turn, looks like this. So we would like to receive some data and be able to send, send some data. And we would like to use some modern reactive functional approaches in order to process our data, in order to build some pipeline of data processing data same. So this is the essential part of what we would like to see. Finally, we would like to start our server by calling this art and subscribing to our server. And this will finally execute our server engine and start listening to some connections. So this is what we would like to see under reactive server engine, and under essential reactive server engine. We are not talking about HTTP and so forth and so on. And we are talking about just essential reactive server engine. Okay, so this is just essential part. The second question, why do we need to see exactly this? Why do we need that? Or what's wrong, first of all, with normal, everyday, the, the approach that recommended for a long time, like synchronous blocking approach? What's wrong with that? In order to show you what's wrong with this blocking I.O. and this blocking uh, approach, synchronous approach, imperative approach, I'm going to show you a demo. I don't like to, to waste your time and show some slides and argument, with some, uh, an argument about the efficient of uh, blocking server engine. I just like to, to write some simple server, some simple echo server, which uh, will handle incoming bytes and send an echo response back. So here is our uh, normal approach that we had for starting from Java 1. So it's, it's a, essential, the most uh, initial part of uh, how to build server socket. And here we have some flow of, of accepting data. So we have just process an input stream and provide some uh, data processing here and use uh, some streaming approach, like I read an input stream, like a buffer read, like line one line by line, and yeah, uh, write processed lines back to to output stream. So this is basically our server. So let's start it. Let's just simply start it and see whether it works, right? Okay, we have started our server. So I'm going to use. Telnet, do you see it well? Okay, I guess it's better. So here I connect, I have already connected to, to my server, and if I write something, I will receive echo as a response. So my server just works. Hello, everyone. And my server responds with the echo. However, what if I would like to open one new connection? Here I'm opening one new tab and connect to my server and start sending some messages and nothing happened. Nothing happened, nothing happened. This is because our server is blocking. So we have only one thread, which is main thread, which process all the incoming data. So if we have blocking, if we, we blocked here, then we, are, we won't accept any new connections. In case if we close our previous tab, we will see that we got a response. So our connection has handled and we got response and now this connection works. So which means that this, the synchronous approach in a different way. Okay, someone can say, Let's try to use multi-threading. So let's uh, let's use some execute some thread pool in order to handle all the incoming connections, right? So we can use executor service, for example. We can create new fixed thread pool because we would like to utilize our hardware efficiently. We can create a thread pool with the size of of available uh, core on my computer. So and we can. Um, submit the processing of accepted socket onto separate thread. So let's do that by moving uh, our execution to a separate uh, to a separate thread. Also, I don't like to handle all this exception because here we, we have EU exception, there we have EU exception. Who'd like to handle all this exception? I don't like 
anyone would like to, to handle it. Zeus, I'm going to use some uh, fancy library from um, Gregor, Gregor Spivovary, uh, which allows us to, to wrap our lambda into some th throwing, uh, throwing function. And we'd, in, in that case, we don't have to handle all this, all this exception. So it simplifies the uh, readability of our code. So let's just restart our server. And let's see whether this approach is better, right? So we have our server. Let's connect it to it. Yeah, it works. Let's open new one connection. Yeah, it works. Let's open new one. Let's see. Uh, yeah, it works. A new one works. Still works. And still works. And still works. And another one. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? It should work. It doesn't work because we have the same problem. We have a fixed thread pool, which have only eight threads in there. So this thread pool are cap is capable to handle only eight connections. And then the rest of the connection will be enqueued in this thread pool. So it doesn't solve the problem. Of course, if we close this connection, or for example, this one, and open new one, we'll be able, uh, not that, we'll be able to, to connect again and start interacting with the server. But it doesn't work because we would like to handle a lot of user in our server. Of course, someone can say it. Let's use cached thread pool. Why do we need to use fixed size thread pool? Let's use cached thread pool. New cached thread pool. We have unlimited amount of thread in there. So let's just restart our server and see whether it works or not. Okay, we have connected our server. Let's close all these guys. Yeah, it works. It works again. I'm not going to open again the huge amount of tabs, but I have a little small piece of code which could DDoS or DOS my server. So here I have a test which creates 5,000 of connections. Let's start with a smaller amount of connections. Let's just see whether it, it does or not our service. And start connects to our service and start sending some hello DOS attack and re read some data back. So this is the main functionality of this piece of code. So let's just run it and see whether it would work or not. So it works. So we created 1,000 of connections. Of course, if we open new connection from PEP, we will see a little bit higher latency. It's not visible from, from the UI side, but you just you can't believe me. We will get some impact on the, on the performance from the latency, of course. However, what if you like to run a little bit more new connections? Will, it our, will our service be capable to, to handle all this, all this connection? Let's see. So in this case, we are going to run to open 5,000 5, of open connections. And we see that only open 4,000 and our server exploded. Because thread is really a uh, heavy part of GVM. It took around one megabyte of stack. And we don't have enough memory of, in our application. Of course, we can raise our heap size we cartoon our service the size, but it doesn't work like that. We would like to have high performance and low latency server. So we need to use a little bit different approach. So let's just stop our server. Let's just uh, let's don't don't waste um, our memory. Let's kill this guys guys well, and let's back to our slides. So. We have an efficient resource usage, and as you have seen, this DDoS uh, application were capable to kill my computer. So you just imagine what could happen with real servers. Um, yeah. 
Another drawback is increasing of latency. It's less visible, but in case if we have a huge uh, hip size, in, in case if we tune our server to handle more than 5,000 of threads, then you will see the decrease in, in increase in latency. And our user should, must, be a, must uh, wait a little bit more for the response. And of course, this approach is easy to DOS, as you have seen. So, what we can do regarding that? Fortunately, with Java 4, with Java 1.4, we got a non-blocking I.O. Have you ever heard about non-blocking Neo? Okay, a few hands, cool. So, this, with Neo we got um, the, the following approach. Um, I'm, I'm going to, to, to explain you a little bit what we got with new Neo. First of all, we got a class called server socket channel, which is new non-blocking server socket, which is capable to handle a new connection asynchronously. In order, in order to communicate uh, this, server uh, this uh, server socket channel, Neo, Neo introduced selector. Selector is another class in Neo, which allows us to listen, to start listening to the server socket channel events and what is going on inside server socket channel. And we, for example, can register, register into the selector operation. Some we, we can show that we are interested in, for example, we're interested in operation accept. So in case if we, the server is handled, handled has handled, uh, for example, socket channel. So socket channel is a sort class which represent an incoming connection. So in case we handle socket channel, selector will notify, will send us a selection key. This is a for approach, the for class, false class, which uh, notifies that we got a new, uh, we accepted a new connection. So in this case, we can listen to socket channel. You, you, you can see, previously we listen to server socket channel, now we're listening to socket channel itself. And we can register to our selector, for example, interest that we are interested in incoming data from this socket channel. So we can register another selector, into another event into our selector, and once we got some new incoming data in our socket channel, selector will notify us about that. So once we got the notification, we can safely read, non-blockingly non read our data from this socket channel. Of course, we would like to protest this data somehow. And the final operation in this flow is writing data to socket channel back. However, this part is a little bit tricky because with not blocking approach, we won't write, could, like th this may happen that the data won't be flushed fully. So we can write, for example, a part of the data or a part of, of buffer in socket channel is available currently for writing. So we need to handle this er, and tackle this problem somehow because we can block our threat, right? Because this is non-blocking approach. Fortunately, socket channel provides us ability to register another, the third type of events in the selector. For example, we are interested in currently in listening to write operational or availability for to write some data into the socket channel. So once we got a notification, we can safely write data to, to socket channel back and flush it. So this is how we should work with new non-blocking approach that offered in uh, starting from Java 1.4. From the code perspective, the same, uh, this approach looks like the following. So in order to open our server and bin to a to, to specific port, we need to, to write, uh, to open server socket channel, bin to, to specific port, and the most important, we need to configure it as non-blocking. This is the important part. Then we need to register and open a selector and register that currently we are interested in, in, accept, in even that accept connections. So once, we did that, we need to, to run some processing logic. You can see while true loop, which is fine because uh, it won't iterate all the time, it won't waste our CPU, but in case if we have some incoming uh, selection key, 
it will, han send the to it, it, it will handle the selector in case if we don't have any data to process, it will block the, the thread and we will sleep and won't waste our resources. So it's basically, it's, this part is basically going to run our server and start processing some data. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper in, in, in how we should work with new non-blocking approach. This is the expanded part of wild troop. So as you can see here is a, the part related to um, connection setting. So this is a central part that we usually should write in order to accept uh, new connections using Neo. So we have just, using this part of code, we just accept new, new connection, say that we would like to configure this incoming uh, socket channel as non-blocking as well, and usually we have to register this socket channel and relate some queue in order to store some data in this queue. Uh, because this is just an initial part of, uh, of socket channel processing, it will be handled only once. Finally, we, sh we should register or we should show the intent that we would like to listen to new events, um, in this socket channel, so we will, we will register uh, and attach uh, this socket channel to our selector as well. Then, the second part is, of course, data reading. So this is uh, the, the next branch, which is data reading. So in case we got some information that there is some data in, in, in our socket channel, we are going to find first our socket channel um, and uh, retrieve it from the key, then we uh, create some, allocate some buffer because with new, uh, with Neo we got some uh, notion called byte buffer in order to store some, some buffer of bytes in memory. And uh, we are going to, to uh, read some data from this buffer. What's going on next? In case if everything is fine, in case if we got some, uh, if we, we were capable to read some data from the channel, we need to store it somewhere. So we need to use our registry in order to, to store uh, to this channel related byte buffers. And we need to, of course, build some uh, processing logic. This is another opportunity that we need to solve in the For example, imperative programming in order to, to, to process and handle buffers. It's not clear for now. At least I don't know how to clearly build the processing flow in this case. And finally, after all of these actions, we need to say, okay, we need to write this data back to, 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 to our socket channel. So please let us know when there is available space uh, in the socket channel to write. So finally, the latest branch is um, related to data writing. So we, what we do here, we just retrieve the, the, the socket channel again. We just retrieve the associated queue uh, to this uh, socket channel. And then we start writing data uh, to the buffer. In case if everything is fine, this buffer will be written uh, and flushed to socket channel. And then after all, we will say, okay, now we, we are ready to, to handle data again. And so forth and so on and so forth and so on. So this is how we have to work with, uh, with Neo. So the main question, where is the complexity? I guess it everywhere because Neo in general is really complex. It's not easy. The second part, the selector and data is separated. So you have seen that selector is another part which just notify us about availability of the data and data is in the socket channel. So we don't have a clear flow of, uh, of events or something like that. Another part is reads and writes to the socket. It's a complex part as well, so we have to know how to write and read data with new asynchronous and non-blocking approach. In turn, as you can remember, at the beginning we said that we would like to have a pool of workers, so we would like to, 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 to have some multi-threading and efficient resource utilization in our server engine. And we would like to see, for example, something called bug pressure, so we, don't like, we would like to control our of a reading depends on the availability of the socket channel to write. So how to do that? And I guess there is no simple answer to that question. So we, it's really hard to, to, to work with Neo. So it's a complex solution. And there is a good uh, quote from, uh, from a friend of mine and wise man 
whose name you, I guess, know is Dr. Venkat Subrama, who says, don't walk from complexity. Run from it. So the question, in which direction should we run? I guess the answer is in the direction of reactive stream and in the direction of functional approach. First of all, have you ever heard about reactive streams? Okay, just a few hands. So reactive streams is a specification for stream processing. So this specification give us a synchronous non-blocking stream paradigm. It naturally fits new because we have like connection is a stream of data, right? We have client which sends data to our server and server sends data back to client and so forth and so on. It's a stream. So reactive streams should fit very well to to Neo, to connection, and the data processing should be like a pipe, of like a stream. And finally, in reactive stream, we have a built-in back pressure. So it's a part of the specification, which is good. All right, reactive streams is just a specification. So we have to have some library on top of that. Fortunately, we have Project Reactor. Have you ever heard about Project Reactor? Okay, just a few hands. Okay, then I will, be, uh, I will explain it more when I will do a live coding, not live coding, but explanation of reactive server engine. Uh, so, in, 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 in a sense, Project Reactor is a superset library on top of reactive streams. So it's library that implements this specification. In turn, Project Reactor offers us extensive set of operators. So in general, Project Reactor has functional reactive style of code writing, it, and it offers a lot of operator in order to process incoming data. Finally, it has an amazing built-in thread manipulation. So we have a few operators which allows us to manipulate the, the, the execution in which uh, the data processing, the, the thread in which data processing is happened. So it's an amazing project and recommend you to, to uh, read it afterward. But, but current, now let's, let's do some coding. Let's see at the, at the real server implementation. So, uh, let's remove this piece of code because we don't like it. <coughs> this is a bad approach. And currently I'm not going to, to write a lot of code because it will be too, 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 uh, too boring to, to see how I'm writing code. I'm going to show you and explain step by step how we can write, how ca we can build the reactive server so you will be able to, to reproduce it at home in under one hour. So let's just uh, restore what I delete before this, uh, before this presentation. So, in essence, as you can as you can remember, we we would like to see two basic class in our in our uh, API of our new reactive new or new reactive server engine. So, we, as from the server perspective, we would like to see two basic method basic methods. First one is handling of the incoming connection. So we would like to provide some, uh, some function which allows us to, to handle incoming connection and then uh, transform it to the stream. And the second part is starting of our stream itself. So we would like to just say, okay, now we are ready to start and it returns mono. So let me explain um, a little bit uh, deeper what is connection. So connection is just two basic methods, receive and send. As you can see, here we interact with, uh, here it returns something called Flux. So Flux is a part of Project Reactor, so it's Reactor Core. And Flux is a stream of data. So it's a synchronous non-blocking stream, like for example we have in Java 8, we have a stream API. Have you ever worked with stream API? I guess everyone worked with stream, API, uh, with stream API in Java 8. So this is similar to stream API, but it's asynchronous and non-blocking. So this is approach and class which is offered by a project reactor. And the same is mono, but mono is for one element. In case if flux is for stream of data, mono is for one element. So it's a way to process one element. It's like completable future in Java 8, okay? So this is two basic class with, with essential class with which we are going to work in, in this session. The third one is a publisher. Publisher is a part of reactive stream specification, so it's, it's a class which just has 
one method subscribe, which allows us to subscribe to the stream. And Flux and Mono extends uh, Publisher. So you can see that this is a part of Reactive Streams. Mono does the same, Publisher. So uh, we have a receiving part, so we use a method receive, we receive a stream, we can build a pipeline of data processing, and using send, we can then send this pipeline of messages, of by buffers. Finally, we don't like to start writing data immediately. We would like to, to, to be driven by server because server can prepare something for us. So once the server will execute Mono and say, okay, I'm ready to, 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 to start writing, we should start writing. So this is an essential part. And now I'm going to, to, to switch to uh, the implementation of, not the implementation of reactive server engine, but uh, to implementation of default connection, because this is the essential part. Es connection is the essential part. What I would like to see in, in, in connection part is ability to, to listen to incoming selection key. So what I would like to see is that I am capable to receive some notification from the selector. So I would like to have a stream of select selection key. So selection key is a part of, uh, of NEO. This is the kind of notification about availability of something. In our case, this stream should returns or should have only, uh, should has only um, selection key related to reading. So this stream will notify us about the readiness of uh, of the channel in order to read some data. And this part will notify us about the, the readiness to write something to this selection channel. All right, uh, what, what next? The next part is, let's try to understand what we need in, in, on the receiving part. How to create this logic of data processing and create it, first of all, back pressure able. So first of all, Flux is, uh, is, has back pressure under the hood, so we don't have to, to care a lot uh, about back pressure because it's a built-in feature, so we just need to use uh, the available operators in, 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 uh, in Project Reactor. As, 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 as the first step, as you can remember, we need, to, uh, we need to handle and we need to show the intent that we are ready to read some data from the stream. The, uh, the good point to, to do that is when we subscribe it to the stream. We don't like to immediately register the intent to read some data because our everything is asynchronous and non-blocking and lazy. And for example, uh, our client or user of our API can, can say, okay, I don't like to handle this connection because it's something wrong with this. But if we do it synchronous and eagerly, we would have to, to, to specify the, the, the step of for example, uh, selection key registration in our uh, socket channel previously, so uh, we will just waste our resource. So we need, it, we need to do that a little bit later. So we need to specify uh, to register, to start listening to, uh, to incoming data only when we subscribe it to the channel. So when we started our execution. So for that purpose, we use do on subscribe method which allows us to execute some logic at the very beginning of the stream. The next part is, of course, data reading. So we have an essential part that you previously saw in, on the slides, which is related to reading data from the, uh, from the channel. So we have socket channel, which we got from, uh, from this reactive server. So we expect it to, to, to get because reactive server has already uh, re read, read it from, from, um, from the selection key. So why we, do we need to, to read it twice? We just need to use it. So we use selection key, selection channel in order to read some buffer of data. We allocate this buffer of data. And in case we read something, we need to return. In this case, we return instead of buffer, we return mono. This is a convenient way in reactive stream because uh, we, can, we can't return null. So this is a problem, we can't, we can't return null. So instead of null, we have to return stream in this case. In this case, we return a stream of one byte buffer, or in case we don't have any data uh, read from, from socket channel, we need to return mono empty. This is how it should be work with reactive approach. 
I can't just use null. Also, I'm using uh, this fancy library that allows me to avoid creating, um, creating try-catch logic. So this is just basically uncheck it, uh, throw in functions. And the second part, so let's just hide this for, for, for a second. The second part is the, the data sending. In this case, the, the basic, the essential part is we need to just handle the publisher since we would like to have a fancy API for data processing, we need to just say, okay, Flux, modify my publisher and wrap it into the Flux, and then subscribe to it. And we can create here an anonymous class of subscriber, which is a part of, uh, of reactive streams. So subscriber is, again, a part of reactive stream. But I, but I don't recommend you to create and implement subscriber interface yourself, because it's a little bit hard. There is some hidden complexity in reactive streams. So we can use another approach. Reactor offers us a class for that. Reactor offers us a class called base subscriber. So I'm, I'm going to extend this class instead of um, implement anonymous class in order to just make my code clear. So base subscriber allows me to, to, to use a few methods from uh, what, I, what I want to, to use in, from subscriber. So in this case, we want to use just, just a few methods. We need to use hook on next, which is just a, a method which will be called when we got some data, and hook on subscribe when we got just a subscription, first subscription of the stream. This is just initial state. So let's start from the, from the handling and writing data to the stream. So this part relating to data writing. So here we have the similar what you saw previously uh, on the slides. So we use socket channel, we write in comment buffer to socket channel, we got the information of how many bytes has been written to this socket channel, and in case if everything, something went wrong, we just say, okay, we would like to give up with that, we would like to cancel this stream at all. So we use the API of base subscriber, like we would like to access upstream and say goodbye, we don't like to, to work with you anymore. And in case if everything is fine, we need to check whether, the, whether all the buffer has been written. So we check whether there is some remaining part of, of, of data in the buffer. In case we have some data, we need to store it somewhere. So for that purpose, I have a field ca called current buffer, because we don't want, we have back pressure. We don't want to buffer a lot of, a queue of, 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 of byte buffers. We only know that we, we want to, to handle one byte buffer, and if everything fine, we will request another one. So we store this byte buffer here, and in case we use current selection key, which we uh, get from reactive server, and we say, okay, now I'm ready to, to say, to, to listen to incoming writes. Tell me when, when, the, uh, when the channel, my channel is available to, to write some data. And I say, okay, since it could happen in separate thread. I, should, I, I need to make sure that uh, my selector uh, has been notified about my intent. So I need to say, okay, wake up, guy. Listen, to check whether, I don't ha whether you have some, some information about writing for me. So this is basically it. And once it happened, uh, we have, you, rem you should remember, we have another stream of write, of write notifications. So we may use this stream on the subscription time, because this is the, the appropriate uh, time and appropriate place to, to, to subscribe to the stream. So everything is uh, wired, everything is, is the, the stream is established, so we can process and start listening to the incoming data. So Reactor offers us best, better approach to create subscriber. We can just pass a lambda to, to, sub, to Reactor API, and we may say, okay, once we got a notification, once we got a selection key, about uh, writing, uh, ability to write some data in, into selection channel, we can say, okay, let's try to write data again. And if it's happened, we are going to request one element, one more element from upstream. In this case, we are going to control back pressure. So everything is driven by the ability to write data to the socket channel. And finally, Okay, this is the, the, the essential part, and one, now we need to understand how Reactor could help us with 
efficient data processing, how we can parallelize our processing, how we can use um, a lot of pro how we can use our hardware in the full power, how we can use multi-threading with reactor. For that purpose, reactor offers us a few, uh, one single operator for uh, for multi-threading. Publish on operator allows us to switch the execution from one thread to another. So here we have publish on which switch the execution from the main thread, in this case because everything is sent from main thread to specified scheduler. So we are going to talk about scheduler a little bit later. So we are going to switch the downstream to another worker and everything down the publish on will be processed in the another worker, in the another thread. The same we have there. We don't like to work with the complexity of multi-threading. Let's keep it with reactor. So we would like, we don't like to, to process the same method in the separate thread because in this case we would have to, to mark our buffer as volatile as well. And who knows what could happen with, with our processing. We have to, to pay a lot of attention and this is a problem. We don't like to work with multi-threading it, it itself. We, we would like to just keep it with reactor. So for that purpose, we are going to publish our socket channel notification from the main thread to our scheduler again, for, to our specified worker, to our worker to, which, to worker to which this connection is attached. So the hook on next will always be executed within one scheduler. And this is amazing. We just need to use one operator for that. The second part that I missed there that I uh, haven't shown you is we need to, to, to always update our sele selection key because we need to always work with the latest selection key in order to notify our selector. So we need to use some API in order to make some uh, external modification and in this case we need to, to use volatile because we have, it's possible to call this toxicity field from multiple threads. But it does, it's fine in this case. The same we have here, but here, once we got a notification about ability to write, we immediately switch our interest to read again in order to not overwhelm us by, by selection key selector notifications. So this is the essential part of, of uh, default connection and now we are going to switch to uh, reactive server implementation. So we need one method uh, in order to understand what is going on there. So this uh, the start method looks like the following. We create a flux. We, we create a, man a flux which allows us to manually supply events and notify our downstream about what is going on with our stream. Then we would like to run our server on a separate thread. For that purpose, we use similar operator to publish on. We use subscribe on, which allows us to run this function within the create operator on the specified thread. So in this case, uh, we use scheduler, okay, uh, oh, oh, I forget to, to explain you a little, bit, a little bit more about schedulers. So schedulers is a specified class in reactor which allows us to, to access a pool of worker. Here we have a single tone pool of worker which is called parallel, so, it, uh, so it's, um, it has the same amount of worker as we have core in our, uh, in our, on our machine. And since we would like to, to have only one worker, the same, the same worker during the whole execution, we should use uh, the scheduler's single uh, method which allows us to take one worker from this pool and convert it to scheduler and use all the way in our stream. So here how we use scheduler in, in our execution uh, in, in connection. The same we use in React in reactive server part, but here we create a separate new single thread on which everything uh, is executed within uh, our main logic. And here is our main processing part, which is uh, similar to what we have seen a few a couple of minutes ago on the slide. So this is unfortunately the complexity of non-blocking I/O. We, we don't have any other option to to open the socket channel. We need to do it the same all the way down. So we need to open the socket channel and say, okay, we're going to, to, be, to be in the specified uh, socket address. So here we got socket address from our uh, interface. Here we need to say, okay, it's non-blocking. Here we need to open selector and here we need to uh, register selection key. 
Uh, finally, here we have a while true prothesin which, which you saw previously. So here we have the similar prothesin logic, the same three branches of, of logic. Here we have socket exception, so we, ha we accept the socket, configure it as non-blocking, and put it to the registry as previously. Then we just handle our uh, connection handler and allow the user to, to, to process, to build some pipeline of data processing. Finally, we subscribe to, to the return at stream and say, okay, you are ready to, to start uh, your data reading and writing. Finally, here we have a read data processing. We are going to back to, 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 to the hidden complexity here, but yeah, let's, let's take a look at, at uh, reading and writing. Here we access the registry and say, okay, we need to notify our connection about, our, our found connection about a uh, new event, about uh, new data. And here we, we need to notify that, in this way we notify that, okay, we are ready to, to start writing to the socket channel. Uh, a few words about what is sync. Sync is a convenient way in Project Reactor to send data manually. So sync is basically sync. You can send and supply data to the stream manually. So we have the same, since you, you should remember that default connection uh, requires to, 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 uh, to, to accept in the constructor two streams of data, we need to, to use the same approach or similar approach in order to supply these events manually. But that proposed reactor offers us two pro something called a processor. processor. So we, have, we use unicast processor, which is convenient way in reactor to supply data manually. We put this, to pro this processor and sync from this processor to, to tuple. So it's a, it's a kind of tree with two branches in this case with left branch and right branch to which we can access. And we say, okay, now we pass this processor to our connection, so connection can utilize them. This is, then we can use this, for example, we can use read processor in order to send read notification and write processor in order to, to, to send notification about writing. So this is the essential part of how it works. Now we need to, to check whether uh, our server uh, really works. So here is how we can use our API in action. Here we, can, here we create and bind our server to localhost 8080. Here we write the processing logic using Reactor. So this is Project Reactor and here is a huge amount of operators and we can utilize and users of our API could, could utilize in order to build some data uh, some processing pipeline, but, but we, here we have the same echo server, so we just say, okay, echo, transform incoming by buffer to stream, and send it back. So this is basically it. This is what our service, do, our service does. Um, now let's go on to run our application and see whether it works or not. This is an important part. Of course, uh, I have some tests for here, we're going to r run it a little bit later. But now let's check whether our application works. So it works, it works, it's good. If you open another connection, you will see it works again. And now the important part of our experiment is to understand whether our service is capable to, to handle that amount of connection. Because previous implementation, block and synchronous, hasn't been able to, to, to do that. So let's try to, to run our doser. Hope this time my computer will, will handle that. Okay, we handle the connection and we got 5,000 of open connections. And here we have like an active writing and reading. And if we are going to use my monitor of processors, we will see that all the cores are efficiently, are utilized efficiently. So here we have a full utilization of my computer. In case if I'm going to, to stop this doser application, in case I'm going to, to kill this up, we are going to see that the load is going to decrease. So in case if we don't have any work, we don't use any, we don't use hardware that way. In case if we have a lot of work, we utilize the full, the full amount of power in, of my computer. This is good. 
This is a good part of, of reactive server approach. And here I have a few tests which checks that uh, we have back pressure supports. So let's run them. If you are interested in what's, in what's going on there, just came to me and uh, we, will can, we, we could discuss that. Uh, I guess we don't have enough time for that. Okay, let's, let's skip this part and let's back to our slides. First of all, I would like to, 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 to make, pay your attention on not worthy points in, in what we did. First of all, Project Reactor offers us an amazing, um, a lot of capabilities in order to work with multi-threading, with asynchronous and non-blocking approach. And one of this amazing part is ability to work with worker pools. So schedulers allow us to specify the pool of workers really easy. It's a singleton pool of workers which could be used the whole, the, the whole road of our application, the, the whole way of our, our application runtime. Flux Publish On allows us easily to specify on which thread we would like to execute our data processing. So we can easily attach our incoming connection to a specific worker from that thread pool. Finally, using scheduler single, we can specify a, sp a particular worker from this thread pool and use it along all the way in our connection. So we can use the same worker, the same thread in a several place uh, in our stream. This is also important. And finally, so let, we can use it and attach it to, to our connection. And finally, let's do some sum up of what, was, uh, what has, has been going on there. First of all, uh, the NEO is still complex. As you have seen, even though we wrapped our, uh, we created some wrapper around NEO and socket server uh, with reactive APIs internals is complex still, so we don't have any choice to, any, uh, any option to, to, to write it in a different way and make it better. However, the reactive scenes approach and reactive scenes specification simplifies the API a lot. So we have a streaming approach on, on, in, our, in our API right now, which is good. Finally, Reactive streams, also reactive streams, brings us back pressure, which is a building part of our reactive uh, server. Of course, we, you saw that in our case, we used um, like kind of one by one data consuming, but, but we can tune that. We can measure how many data we are, were capable to write uh, to, this, to the TCP connection in this case, and we can tune our, the size of uh, of, of requested amount, and we can request, for example, more. We, we, first, we need to we can request one, then we can request two, then we rec can request four. If we blocked, we can say, okay, this is the appropriate side which we can uh, request from a socket uh, from upstream right now. So we can tune that part, but it's another it's another part of uh, of, of of this application. It doesn't matter for now. Also, we got a fancy and really. A powerful API using Project Reactor, which allows us to build really complex processing logic. And it simplifies, in general, the building of the complex multi-threading, data processing, and so forth and so on. Finally, yes, as I said, simple Project Reactor simplify multi-threading. Finally, you may ask whether I need really this kind of approach. Maybe we need something different. Of course, we have nowadays frameworks for that purpose. We have Netty, for example. Have you ever heard about Netty? So a few hands. Netty is a powerful, asynchronous, non-blocking server engine. Unfortunately, it's imperative and it's really complex. However, there is reactor Netty. There is implementation of reactive approach, the same similar API that we have uh, seen during the, the, that we have seen during this talk, uh, but using Reactor, uh, using Netty as the core server engine. So you can use this as a better approach. Finally, to learn more about reactivity, to learn more about Neo, I would, I would recommend you to see this video from Hank Kabutz. Someday I have inspired by his talk and uh, expi inspired to learn more about Neo. In case if you are curious about uh, Reactor, just visit the uh, the, the, the web page about Project Reactor, and in order to learn more about Reactor Netty, I recommend you to, to, to see what is going on in, on the, in the source code and GitHub repository. 
First of all, thank you for your time and for your attention. And if you have a uh, question, I'm welcoming you to, to backstage because we don't have any more time. And have a nice uh, the, the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.